State of the Industry podcast. This episode is brought to you by KP Movement Education, your source for health and movement education and coaching. Whether you are a health or fitness professional, a fitness consumer, or perhaps a passive bystander, KP believes that everyone deserves the right to pain-free movement. That's why their memberships and services are designed to educate, empower, and inspire you to create a culture of movement for yourself and those around you. With two membership options, you will find education surrounding developing at-home training programs for yourself or for others, mental health and exercise, lifestyle medicine, and much, much more. Check it out at kineticperformance.ca backslash memberships. That's kineticperformance.ca backslash memberships. Hey, FitFam, welcome back to the State of the Industry podcast. I am your host, Adam Yangsma. In this week's episode, we bring you a very special guest. He is a gentleman that I have had the privilege of hearing speak on numerous occasions, and he is wicked smart. But in addition to that, he's also invented one of the coolest fitness tools that I've ever had the opportunity to use. He is Michel Dalcor. Michel is an internationally recognized industry leader in health and human performance. He is the founder and CEO of the IOM, or the Institute of Motion. He is the inventor of the Viper Pro, and he is the co-founder of PTA Global. He has given hundreds of international lectures, which, as I mentioned, I have had the opportunity to sit in on, and he has been a featured speaker at most of the world's top fitness conferences, fitness clubs, and at many colleges and universities around the world. Michel specializes in health and human performance, consulting with many of the fitness industry's biggest companies, including Equinox, Microsoft, and Nike. Within this, he talks a lot about variability and the importance of it within our training programs for the client's resiliency over time. And we get into how you can utilize this variability without changing everything that you do. And he lays everything out in a very, very simple way using what they you uh, call their four Q or four quadrant model for programming. And so there's going to be a lot of really great takeaways. I had massive amounts of notes when we actually did the podcast. So sit back, grab a pen and paper and enjoy. Welcome, Michelle, to the State of the Industry podcast. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, I appreciate your time today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for joining us. I, I always love, I got to say, so I teach at a at college up here, Centennial College, and uh, the coordinator and myself, we're really into the variability, the uh, different types of training, training outside of just sagittal plane or even just frontal plane and adding kind of three-dimensional movement. And uh, one of the first guests I ever had is a good friend of yours, Chuck Wolf. Great friend. And I sat down with him in Orlando and we chatted all about kind of three-dimensional movement. And he was like, hey, uh, you know who you should talk to? Michelle, you should, yeah, you should, do you know who he is? And I'm like, yeah, yeah I know who he is. I've, I think I've been to a couple sessions of yours uh, at Idea or, or Camp at Pro, you know, because you're all over the place. And um, yeah, you've had a great effect. I had to say this because my coordinator is like, hey, you know, you got to, you got to just, he won't know who I am because you, you did, um, I think, a, an in-service with twist conditioning at some point. And uh, he was one of their, their trainers there. And he's like, man, he changed the way I thought about movement and kind of changed the direction of his thought process. And so, um, yeah, we both are very, very grateful for what you, the Institute of Motion, um, Jan was the first person who ever introduced me to the Viper in Australia when I was at Phylex. And so, um, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this chat because I know there's a lot of information and you are a wealth of knowledge. So I want to tease some of that out. So thanks for being on. Yeah, listen, I appreciate the kind words. Uh, that means a lot. And uh, we're in an industry that is full of good people that want to do good things. And so. You know, I, I appreciate the sentiment of um, and the spirit with which you know you're uh, you're stating those things. So thank you. Yeah, I have to ask before we actually get started. Where did the nickname Moose come from? Well, probably because uh, a Canadian. Well, I was 
I was still living in Canada when I was doing a lot of the education for, you know, companies like PT on the net and we would travel, you know, to different countries. And so uh, there's like Rod Korn and some of these guys really took it upon themselves because they're not from Canada, took it upon themselves to kind of attach a Canadianism to, to my identity. <laughs> and I suppose that one was the easiest one. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And, and yeah, I think that's where it started. And then of course it's stuck. Yeah. My nice. family calls me solely. So you can call me solely too, if you want. Solely. Perfect. Yeah, e either one. <laughs> All right. Perfect. All right. So can you, uh, just walk our listeners through, um, just a little bit of a background about where you've come from and gotten to where you are with the Institute of Motion and as the, you know, developer of the Viper and because I know you went to the University of Alberta and that was kind of a big piece, but can you just talk about your path through the industry thus far? Yeah. So, you know, I, I always say that I didn't get into this industry because of any athletic prowess or, you know, any type of experience within that industry. And I thought I might parlay that into a career. In fact, quite the opposite. I was a, a shy, uh, diminutive kid who was, you know, kind of not really good at sport or movement at all. And, you know, I think where I got my curiosity from in terms of this particular was my brother was athletic. Um, he started my, my journey in more the, in the gym scenario, right? Yeah. Back in the day, it was body part driven, which was, you know, what we did. And then, you know, that, that, that thrill and that, uh, you know, that, that leaning into, you know, those experiences in the gym wanted you know, I think it drove me to want to know more about the body. And then, of course, I, I wanted to take more of that type of course within a university setting. Yeah. And so that was what I did. And then I went to University of Alberta. I was in the faculty of phys ed. And, and the courses that I took were all, you know, the non-movement based, you know, technical, theoretical courses. Yeah. Uh, that dove deep into the, the understanding of the body and how it crafts its many mechanisms. And so that just, and at that point, you know, that just, it was satisfying my curiosity and I couldn't drink fast enough from that hose. Yeah. So that led me to, you know, getting into the industry of not of palliative care, but certainly of, of prevention in terms of fitness and, and well-being. Uh, and then I did some teaching up in Canada and in the States and then helped a friend of mine who started a, a business called PT on the net, which was really one of the first websites for personal trainers on education. Yep. And, you know, he was my best friend still is. And, you know, he started back in 99, 1999. And I remember, you know, trying to get the URL with him. And at the time, <laughs> in 1999, I was like, what the heck's a URL, right? Yeah. And so we secured it. And one of his clients said, you just get, you just need to secure the name, you know, personal training or .com or personal training on the net. And so he did, right? Richard Boyd did. And he, and he secured it, not knowing what he would do with it. And then he wrote various articles and then those articles uh, were published. And then he went to other educators at the time. He synergized a lot with the NASM at the time, uh, got more and more education uh, and then built this company up as an education resource for personal trainers. And of course I wrote, I'm going to say I wrote his coattails in the sense that, you know, he brought me along because, you know, I, I was very passionate about education yeah. and, you know, delivered information and he opened a lot of doors for me. And then, you know, then he switched gears and started a company called PTA Global, which was a certification. It was a certification company for personal yeah. training. And so I was involved in co-creating that. Uh, at the same time, uh, a gentleman named Simon Bennett, who is the director of high performance for the Edmonton Oilers, okay. and myself uh, developed a, a tool called Viper. Viper Pro is the new iteration of it, but Viper. And, you know, we took that to the market. And at the same time, I started IOM, which is really, IOM is an applied health and human performance company, Okay. which really means that we take a look at health and we look at human performance equally in terms of how we might create solutions or strategies or, an, or a logic or an operating system. And we point that at fitness, healthcare, and performance. And so that's led us down, you know, a bunch of different tracks in terms of, you know, what we are doing in, in terms of solutions, education, and then who we interact with. So, yeah. you know, that's a little bit of, you know, from where I got to where I am now. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, like I'm familiar each and every one of those companies products that you just talked about from, uh, you know, PTA Global, PT on the net, like I'm familiar with each and every one of those, um, which is amazing because like I've been all over and I see, you know, certifications that are approved by, you know, um, the PTA Global, that kind of thing. So uh, you guys have done a fantastic job getting education, getting information out to not just trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, but also just the general population and allowing them to understand the importance of all these, these concepts. Cause a lot of times I don't think personal trainers are the best at, I guess, explaining why they want variability, something like something like that in their program. Um, but uh, you, you guys do a great job. So can you just explain for the listeners, what, is meant when you talk about variability, because that's one of the reasons why you developed the Viper. Can you just talk about what the importance of variability is for a person, whether they're an athlete or not? So I mean, yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to use two analogies for that. Uh, the first is more of a theoretical kind of physiological analogy. And then the other one is very anecdotal and it's a very practical analogy that we probably all have all heard before. So if we look at, uh, biology. Uh, there is a sweet spot of too little and too much variability, right? In, inherent within our environment is variability. Like if you and I are digging a ditch, you know, very rarely would we repeat a motor task two times in a row, Yeah. right? It's just, it, there's infinite variability because of the demands of where I am in the hole and how much dirt and, you know, how I position my body and what am I throwing it into? It's all oriented very differently from shovel load to shovel load. If yeah. you and I are, are, or if it we're Canadians, we're, we're, you know, we're shoveling we're, snow. We're, yeah, we're shoveling <laughs> snow. So either one, but uh, you know, in that there is a particular variability <clears throat> that comes with life, right? But it's not chaos. It's not so much variability that it's chaotic, but it's not so little variability that it's rigidity, right? So mm -hmm. we see, we see the failings of repetition all the time, right? Yeah. So if we take a look at wear patterns, uh, patterns of stress, uh, overuse injuries, they typically uh, land themselves in this notion of, you know, too much repetition. Mm -hmm. So we want enough to elicit a response and an adaptation, but we want to consider variability as well. So we want to, we want to dance between the two. And that's really a dance, right? Sometimes we get specific and repeated. Sometimes we do not. If you're going to throw a 95 mile an hour fastball uh, or play an instrument, there is going to have to be repetition. Right? You yeah. got to put the reps in, so to speak. And so that's fine. And, and that works so long as we realize that there needs to be a respite from that so that we can organize ourselves for some degree of variability as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the, the kind of the biological answer there would be if we look at our bodies and the systems within our bodies, typically what happens if, it, if it's an aging process or you know, lack of adaptation, uh, if we have an impairment in adaptation, so it basically comes like this. It goes, uh, lack of adaptability leads to functional impairment, which mm -hmm. leads to death, right? So if you look at the cascade of decline of us as physiological beings, a loss of adaptability leads to functional impairment, which leads to death. So if we, and that could be cell death, right? At a local area, it could be organ or organism death. Yeah. But the upstream effect is always loss of adaptability. Mm -hmm. So then if we think about that for a second, we say, okay, wait a second, loss of adaptability. So to be adaptable means to adapt mm -hmm. and to be adaptable and to adapt means we have to have exposure to some variability. Yeah. I mean, it just, it is what it is, right? And so the more we have a swath of exposure to some variable inputs, the more physiologically ready we are yeah. to deal with things, right? So a lot of people are following Wim Hof and his breathing techniques. He doesn't go in just normal ambient temperature. He goes into extreme cold and he might play with temperatures. That is variable stress right? Yeah. It's not just ambient temperature. It is cold. It might be hot. It might be hot and cold. So to uh, input or to allow his body these inputs allows his body to get tolerant of those, let's say those variable inputs and makes him more physiologically ready. Yeah. 
right? The another analogy could be, let's say the farm kid, right? So you and I are baling hay, right? That's a variable task. It's sub-maximal load with high degrees of freedom, meaning, you know, we're loading our bodies in all sorts of weird, odd, uncommon positions. Yeah. And yet that could seem chaotic. It's like, yeah, it's just random. Yes and no, because if you took that farm kid and they wrestled a city or a gym kid, right? And you were a betting person, where's your money? Right. Yeah. And normally, you know, nine times out of 10, the answer is always the same. Yeah. And so what happens is that farm kid, because of the variable inputs, are actually strong in odd positions uh, from head to toe. Yeah. And so by wrestling, which is an odd position thing, or hockey, or football, or any combative sport, that's read and react. These are all read and react environments. Yeah. And they read and react and find themselves in their bodies in, in compromised positions. And yet for their bodies, it's not that compromised because their body is used to it. They've yeah. done it before because they've exposed it before. Yeah. So the idea of consideration of variability is a first start for us. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean you do it every day. It doesn't mean you, that all you do is variability, but we need to consider it. Yeah. And when we do, we start to create what's called, you know, vector variability, which is this idea of farm kid training, right? Mm -hmm. We load the body in different ways. There's also, you know, things like um, motor variability, right? So you don't have kids, but, you know, there's this old adage, right? If you've got a youngster, right, a young child, and it's your child, give them a wide variety of sports to play before you specialize. Why? Because new and novel movement tasks spark, you know, synaptogenesis and neurogenesis. In other words, it sparks the connections or the formations of, of connections within the neural net and just neural growth, right? Yeah. So we're getting basically a more robust, more uh, in, uh, interconnected nervous system. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, then we're looking at, you know, let's say um, postural variability. Like the best posture is the one that moves throughout the day. Yeah. Right. So we got postural variability. Like sitting is not the new smoking because <laughs> if by virtue of that, you stand all day long without moving, well, that's just as bad. In fact, it may be worse. Yeah. In, the more, in, in the more immediate term, because you get edema in the lower extremity. So the solution of idle standing is not, or excuse me, idle sitting is not idle standing. Yeah. Right? The best posture is the one that moves yeah. intermittently throughout the day. Right. And then we can go on. There's nutritional variability. There's eye gaze variability. Like all we're doing is staring into screens right now all day long. Yeah. And we don't have depth of field. We don't get outside and without sunglasses on anymore. So eye variability or gaze variability is still variability. And you look at the research on myopia. What it'll tell you is the same thing. Like get outside and change your depth of field. Yeah. Okay, that's variability, right? Get outside is brightness in your eyes. Yeah. You know, not staring at the sun, obviously, but get brightness in your eyes for five, 10 minutes a day, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to start to create a different receptor activity within your eyes. It starts to work the small muscles that control the eye, the iris, right? Which is the ciliary muscles or the iris itself for your, your pupil. Yep. Um, and so you start to train those small muscles and, uh, and then depth of field is obviously your gaze, right? So near to far, far to near, that's changing your focal length. And that focal length change is critically important for ocular motor inputs. Yeah. And so, you know, the idea of variability and then metabolic variability, which we're going to talk about, I'm sure later on. Yeah. The notion of variability is something that we need to consider. Yeah. Yeah, I love when uh, when concepts overlap. So you're talking about the you know ocular variability, going outside, seeing things, having different uh, you know changes of light. So not just always having your sunglasses on. And you know when you look at like sleeping and and trying to manage when your body feels like it's awake light is a big piece of that and so one of the things uh I'm reading a book called why we sleep right so i've actually finished the book now but you know it's called why we sleep and you listen to what he talks about in that and it's you go outside early in the morning for a walk without your sunglasses doesn't matter how bright it is you go without sunglasses and that's obviously for your body gets the sun in and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, I'm awake. This is the time I have to be up. But also when you're going for a walk and you have light, you have changes because it's dark in your room, then it's light outside. Your body's having to adjust to all this variability. And so I love when, when like concepts all overlap to just make sense for pretty much every situation, every yeah. situation, right? Yeah. 
that. Yeah. So that, that's a fundamental tenet of our biology, Adam. I mean, when you look yeah. at it, we've, I mean, you look at every structure of the body, skin, fascia, bone, uh, muscular systems, nervous systems, they are set up for an omnidirectional variable world. Yeah. Right. It's only when we start jogging on the pavement at the same pace in the same direction on the same surface over and over again, that, that there's at, at the, you know, at the same speed intensity, then, and then the volume is on top of that, that we run into problems so much. Yeah. So that the question then is, were we, were we designed to run because so many runners get injured? And the short answer is of course we were, but yeah. probably we were designed to run in variable terrain, uh, changing our speeds, walk, you know, running around things, you know, gazing and, and gating in different patterns in that boat of running. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I love, like whenever I have a, a runner or somebody who's interested in getting into running and they always ask, you know, so is this a good idea or the, you know, I'm often in a rehab clinic. So the guy's coming in for something, some issue with the lower body typically or the lower back. And we always talk, like I, I evaluate your running. I'm like, well, you have to understand you're running a marathon on a hard, hard, flat surface. Right? Like that's what you're doing. So that's, you know, seven times your body weight, almost every single time that foot touches the ground. If you're a heel runner, four foot's a little bit less, but that's a lot of pressure to be putting through your body. And if it's a hard surface, the surface is not taking in that force. It's pushing it all back. And then you're like, okay, well, I've got hugely comfy shoes. It's like, all right. But that doesn't fix the fact that that repetitive movement is done over and over and over again. Right. So I love the idea of adding variability to, to rehab, which is something that I, I try to do a lot with the clients that I see. Most of what my clients do when they're first starting out is a lot of like body weight, kind of just different movements. Um, like I love animal flow. I love vipers kind of just getting different movement patterns because you can go really, really light with a viper, right? Um, and just kind of adding different changes that way, right? Even like just reaching, like leaning to one side, doing a like something like a lateral lunge or lunging pattern, then reaching to the opposite side. Um, maybe even with like a two pound weight in your hand, just kind of getting that, that feel of that change. When it comes to something like movement prep, how would you, because I like the idea of awakening the body. So how would you in, in, introduce something like variability into uh, movement prep with a client? Uh, well, yeah, great question. So if we're looking at preparation for movement, um, there is the movement aspect of it. And then there's the setting the right conditions in the, in the tissues, mm -hmm. uh, both of those things. So if we, if we went way back and we said, all right, if I was going to prep you, I might set the conditions up right first and then add layers of movement in terms of just, you know, kind of preparatory movement. And then you'd go into your either activity or your boat of exercise or whatever it may be. Yeah. And so when we look at setting the conditions up, right, we typically have a four step process. You know, the first one is what we call fluid dynamics, right? So what we want to do is address blood. We want to address lymph. Uh, we want to address water and the interstitia, which is the fluid between the cells. Yeah. And so we want to get those conditions right. So in other words, you know, if we want to move and we can do that in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, but what we want to do is influence those four uh, fluids. And so if I use body tempering or foam rolling, right, what we're doing is, yeah, we're moving uh, 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 lymph and blood around as well, but we are certainly moving uh, water. Yeah. And what we want that the aim of which is to push water into uh, a connective tissue cell, a, a fascial cell. So I can bind with a sugar receptor, making that fascia stiffer uh, and, uh, and more dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. So it's basically wearing your weightlifting suit that you just made a little bit, you cinched it up a little bit and made it more dynamic, yeah. right? On. That, that would be helpful for movement ability. Um, and then, you know, from there, and so we could do that by virtue of, of you know, foam rolling or body tempering. We can do that in terms of any type of vibration, like a gun or anything of that nature. We can do it through a, a sauna or a hot tub. Mm -hmm. We can do it through a hot shower. We can do it through the old school. I'm jumping on a bike for five minutes Yeah. because, you know, we are circulating blood. We're circulating uh, lymph. And to a certain degree with a repetitive uh, and rhythmical muscle action, we're pumping that fluid through the body. Yeah. So we might say that's the first thing. And then from there, we go to what we call small motor unit recruitment. 
which is really type one motor unit recruitment um, that is close to the joints. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is those are tonic based. Those are, those are the ones that are going to fire first. And if we can get those, let's say up and down regulated with a little bit of acuity, right? Meaning that we're, you know, warming that pathway up. Yeah. Uh, then it's more awake. And if it's more awake, then, you know, the tonic based joint centration or the one that the, the motor units that keep the joints congruent, we're going to wake them up and get them active. So that's step number two, small motor unit recruitment, type one muscles that are close to the, the joint. Think about, you know, your classic rotator cuff exercise for the, for the thrower, yeah. right? They're coming up those muscles that are close to the joint. Okay, great. That'd be one example of many. Uh, we do a lot of breathing techniques for that small motor unit recruitment, and I can explain that later. But yeah, uh, that that's that's what we do. And then from there, step number three is what we call excitation. And excitation is now that we get the fluid going, now that we've got the, the tonic muscles going, can we actually teach muscles to turn on and off? Mm -hmm. And it might seem a little bit unusual, right? Turning muscles off as part of your warm up, yeah, because movement is all about limbs moving joints moving, expressing motion, and motor systems depolarizing and repolarizing, right? So in other words, muscles ha cannot stay on the whole time. Yeah. Right? We can't move. In fact, a terrible mover is the one that has, you know, we're Canadian, so we've walked on plenty of ice in our day. Yeah. And when we w walk on ice, every muscle is on because what's more important for the nervous system is not movement and exquisite movement, it's stability, right? Yeah. And as soon as there's threat to that, i.e. I'm standing on ice, then everything tightens up. And then you and I know what the product of it is. We're not moving very well. Yeah. And so movement is all about the on and the off of the motor unit recruitment. So if we, in step number three, in our warm-ups, teach excitation, which is we'll, we'll turn a muscle or a series of muscles on, and then we will quickly turn them off. Then we will turn them on and we'll quickly turn them off again. That's priming the pump for, you know, good neural patterning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Getting muscles out of the way so we can actually move. And, and warming that system up. And the last one, step number four, is what we call stimulation. Stimulation is eyes, ears, and proprioception. So can we warm up the eyes and train them? Can we get the head and the vestibular system, which is the inner ear, uh, you know, more, more kind of involved, more woken up, if you will, and then proprioceptively. Uh, that could be through touch. That could be through vibration. That could be through padding. That could be through rolling patterns. Any type of proprioceptive mechanical input that is sensory in nature is going to send more information and bathe the neural net with sensory information that wakes it up even more. Yeah. So that four step process preps the conditions up, right? Yeah. From there we can do some mobility stuff or we can do some you know, movement patterning. And what we do is we typically go either loaded or unloaded, doesn't matter, but we do some, you know, premeditated patterns that are perhaps specific to joints or regions of the body that we want to see function well in preparation for our activity or our bout of exercise. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes part of a, you know, five minute, 10 minute sequence of warmups to properly condition the individuals. And, and so all of those things can lie as a, a, a chronological, here's what I do first all the way through. Yeah. And I don't want the listeners to necessarily think that this is a, 20 minute process. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. It can yeah. do all those things in five minutes. Yeah. I think uh, there's a lot of people who, who he would hear something like that and be like, that's four steps. It's going to, you know, even if it's five minutes each, it's now 20 minutes of my hour long workout. And then I got to exactly right. cool, right. cool down at the end. And right. yeah. And, and, and I love that you like the way that you, you lay that out. Um, like I do something very, very similar to that. I don't have the same names for all of that, but very, very similar. And thinking about the like working from the kind of the inside and out with all of the tissues, right? So you're working from like the fluids, getting everything moving so you can make sure that you have, you know, good uh, hydration of the tissues that you've got good movement of blood and lymph, as you said, water in and out of the, the um, interstitial fluids. And then you've got the actual joints themselves. You're preparing them to, be healthy and actually centrate and, and have, uh, you know, uh, like re just really good fluid movement yeah. in that, that second piece. And then you're kind of progressing out. And so, yeah, usually like 
we do, you know, soft tissue. We, we look at the soft tissue first, which is the same kind of thing. We just don't call it fluid dynamics because I, I don't think as deeply as you, I guess. And so we start with that soft tissue and then we go into like breathing and we start at the floor and then we work our way up, right? Like preparing the system and then layering from the inside of the joint out to the bigger, the bigger muscles. So I, I like, I love how you, you lay that out. So it's awesome. And just um, before we continue, another yeah. way that really pieces us together, Adam, is, and we we just talked about this as part of our curriculum that we're rolling out to our students, is if a, any of your listeners know the, you know, the, and we've talked about this just recently, but know rugby, if they're following rugby and, and, and international rugby, of course, you know, one of the best uh, national teams in the world is New Zealand. Yeah. And their All Blacks team is, is made up of, obviously, they're influenced by a lot of Polynesian culture uh and customs and their war dance obviously the haka is their war dance and for any of you that have ever seen the all blacks uh international matches they'll always do that war dance prior to yeah. and they do it for various reasons you know to perhaps intimidate their opponents etc but where this was anchored to was a wisdom that has always been there and if you actually compare what we just talked about scientifically to what they did for thousands of years as a preparatory measure for either uh, engagement of physical uh, outcomes, war, whatever they did, yeah. right? Battle, uh, sporting events that they did, but the haka involves a bunch of different similar things. Like, so they will stomp the ground and pat their bodies, right? Yeah. So that, that is gonna move fluid around. It's also gonna be a lot of sensory rich stimulation. So that's cool. Yeah, their eyes are big, right? So that's a lot of sensory information. They are chanting as loudly as they can outward. So what we call that is we call that percussive exhalation. Mm -hmm. Percussive exhalation requires accessory breathing muscles to be involved. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about that is accessory breathing muscles are primarily stability muscles. Yeah, and if you're expirating, like blowing out air, uh, that is not the diaphragm. Oddly enough. Right, that is the four layers of the uh, abdominal wall. That is your pelvic basin, so your pelvic diaphragm, not your respiratory diaphragm. Yeah. Uh, a lot of your paraspinal muscles, your intercostal muscles. So if you're thinking now, your four layers of the abdominal wall, your intercostal muscles, the pelvic floor, your thoracolumbar fascia, all that is tightening up percussively and then turning off, on and off, on and off, on and off. Yeah. That's setting hoop tension. That is sending tension up in your thoracolumbar fascia. That can an anchor your glutes and lats. That may help your hamstring, uh, save it from straining. All of these things were not thought of in those terms by them. Yeah. They were, that it was a way to prepare the body. And yeah. yet there's infinite wisdom in all of those things because yeah. they are preparing their body. And uh, it, they follow, and it's a dance or a sequence, right, that they do. But there's a lot of wisdom in what they do. And yeah. it anchors to a lot of science that is out there. Yeah, and it's, uh, I love the way that you you put that because, yeah, people see that. All, I haven't seen them live. That's kind of like a, an end goal. Like one of the bucket list things is I want to see a, an All Blacks game live. Yeah. But it's interesting how the body just intuitively knows, right? Like the body actually no, almost knows what it wants, what it likes. And yet um, often we fight against our own best interests in a lot of those things, right? Um, I had uh, Perry Nicholson on uh, the podcast not too long ago, and he walked through some of his lymphatic uh, progressive stuff with us. And, and I do that every morning when I wake up, every day when I go to bed and before every workout to prepare the, the sensory system for what's about to go on, right? And um, yeah, so I love that that's a, a piece of what you guys do as well with, um, with your movement prep and that you actually linked it to something that we, I'm, I'm sure most people are familiar with that because that's like, we do, we're yeah. well known. Well, yeah. And, and we always say, I mean, if you look at my warm up technique that I do, you know, people would give me all the space, even pre COVID, they would give me all the space in the gym that I ever wanted because I, it, it's, it looks a little bizarre at some yeah. time, right? But what I would say in all seriousness, and I get it, you know, it looks bizarre and some people think that's weird. But what I would also share is the notion that I think things are weird until they're not. Yeah. Right. Things are bizarre until they aren't. And so we look at that and you might see my eyes in the gym and I'm doing eye tracking and Michelle looks a little goopy over there. <laughs> and then you'll see the all blacks doing their chant and their eyes are big and they're doing it. And then like, that doesn't look weird. That looks cool. Yeah. And it's perception. Right. And I get it. But 
you know, I would argue that an arm bar with a kettlebell 15 years ago was weird. Yeah. Until it wasn't, right? A, a Turkish getup 20 years ago would have been super bizarre yep. until, until it wasn't. Yeah. And, you know, what I invite, and I think our industry is pretty good at this. I, what I invite is the idea that, hey, can we have a substantive narrative or discussion around these things? And, you know, kind of hold our judgment off for a second, right? Uh, and to explore what may be powerful for the, the human body uh, or for health outcomes or for whatever is interesting and, and relevant uh, for the individual. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we can do that, then, you know, we could probably arrive at some pretty cool places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, I think a lot of the industry has for a long time been led by bodybuilding and powerlifting more recently, CrossFit, um, and kind of very, very almost structured, very specific ways of doing things. And so the, it's almost like there's a protocol in the gym when you warm up, when you are lifting, you know, there's things that you do and there's things that are like, uh, because you go to any commercial gym now, studio, smaller spaces are a little bit different, but a lot of commercial gyms, you walk into them and everything is like, this is how you bench press. This is how you squat. This is how you deadlift. This is, and if you're not doing it properly, some of you like, that's wrong. So I've had people tell me when I'm doing like a, a split stance deadlift or something, or I'm doing, you know, um, kettlebell death marches, like I'm doing my walk forward. They're like, what are you even trying to work here? Yeah. Right? Like, what are you doing? And like, I have to then explain variability and that your body doesn't, you know, when you squat in real life, very rarely do you set up your feet perfectly, you know, exactly where you want them nice and comfortable because you may not have the space. The object might be a little weird, might be off centered. And um, yeah, and it just, it, it, um, it frightens me sometimes that personal trainers are hesitant to get into adding variability simply because of what they're used to and what they understand as being the way that you lift the way that you do that. Right. But you did say that this can be melic. It's not only variability everywhere, right? There's a place in time to lift heavy. There's a place in time to do deadlifts and squats and you know, all that, but you can meld the two together. Yeah. And I think that we, I would say this fashion and fitness are trend-based. Yeah. Right. And we have certain ideologies that take over, which is fine. There's no judgment on that at all. Uh, what we offer and what we try to always land on is, can we actually uh, cut through the noise of dogma or ideology and take a look at what's going on? Yeah. Independent of that. Right. So yeah. whether I have a bias or not, you know, whatever. But if I can look at it independently from that, uh, then I can look at what happens from that input to the adaptation or the outcome of the body. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if I'm doing a heavy squat, the heavier I get, yeah, I get, I get the idea and I get the caution around, Hey, you got to do it this way and this way alone, because yeah. as load goes up, degrees of freedom go down Yeah, and I better adhere to, you know, whatever that technique is because I've got less wiggle room to make a mistake. Yeah. Right? Because if I make a mistake and there's 305 or 505 on my back, then I'm in big trouble. Yeah. Right. So what happens is, you know, the blinders come on in the sense that I've got to adhere to a strict protocol. Yeah. Because the stakes are higher, so to speak. And I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But what we often will do is take that viewpoint for everything. Right. So yeah. if you're doing, let's say, a, you know, a sub maximal load, and we're saying this is exactly how you do that lunge and exactly how you do that, that, that squat. Then I would say, oh, wait a second, because if all I'm doing is strict form, there's a consequence. There's a dark side to perfect form. Yeah. Because it's pattern overload, right? Yeah. And, you know, you wear out the joints quicker in a certain plane of motion. Um, you know, tissues could get exhausted in that plane of motion. Uh, there could be tissue stress. And we see that all the time with, you know, elite sport figures that do repetitive action, yeah. office workers that are on a keyboard. Now there's a thing called texting thumb, which is our theme, our eminence, which is too, you know, it's too contracted right there because I'm sending my texts. Yeah. It's just too much exposure, right? And so with that, when there's too much exposure and there's not enough kind of recovery in the middle or there's not enough variability, then we run into problems. So the debt, we're never, biology is never, uh, it's never binary. It's yeah. never, this is right and this is wrong. 
And that's challenging to folks, right? Because you said, you know, you walk into the gym, they want some guardrails. What are the, you know, what are the guardrails? What are the guidelines? I want it to be very clear. This is right. This is wrong. But, you know, biology is too complicated for that. And so it has redundancies. I mean, systems biology is, you know, a lot of inputs coming in and trillions of inputs coming into our body at once, coordinating themselves, self-organizing two different outputs. Yeah. Uh, and the, the mechanisms for that are many and they're very complicated. So, yeah, I think that the, the, the caution here is that we don't take certain viewpoints of uh, loading at high levels and use those as rules for everything. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's very wise to adhere to, you know, whatever proper technique is when the load goes up and up and up and up. Yeah. Right. Because as I said before, you know, there's, there's less, less wiggle room and there's more consequence to, you know, to, to deviating from that. H yeah. However, if that's all we do, then I think that that poses an equal problem long-term in terms of our capacity to do things. Yeah. And I think you said that really well. One of the things that I like to do, and I think oftentimes when we have new clients, we overcoach them in a lot of the, the, the foundational patterns, like a, a squat, a, right? A, and that's because maybe we're too quick to overload them in those patterns. We start adding load to fix things or, but I like to see like, what does your body think a squat is? Cause it knew how to squat at one point. It, it has that. So looking at, okay, what does your body think is a squat? And then can we constrain the environment to allow you to actually squat properly without adding load yet? And then add variability to that pattern once we've kind of come in to like gain some context in what that is, it's the same thing you can do with lunges and, and, and pushups and those types of things as well. Right. hundred percent. I think that's well said, you know, and you look at motor learning, you look at, uh, you know, guys like Nick Winkleman or Guido Van Rijsen, Jim, they'll, they'll say the same thing. They'll say, uh, put your body, put a, an individual's body in a safe environment, whatever yeah. that means for them and let them make mistakes Yeah. because those mistakes are self-organization. And yeah, body self organizes the task so that it gets a more efficient it you know it works around its, its own constraints and it can repeat the task in a way that is suitable for long term viability of the system yeah and so yeah like i remember guido taking vipers for the first time at the at oregon state university and he was with some athletes and instead of telling them what to do with it he put a bunch in the center of the room and he said, you show me what you would do with this. Now, these athletes had never seen the tool before. Yeah. Right. But what he wanted to do is he wanted to see what they, how they interacted with it and how they self-organized lifting and shifting load around uh, in ways that their bodies inherently knew within the constraints that their bodies had right now. Yeah. Now, can those constraints be uh, expanded or erased, so to speak, in the sense that you know, we're building capacity so that we erase those constraints. Yeah, that's part of the coaching and, and, and uh, athletic development process. Uh, but I think at its first level, it's understanding what the body can do as it self-organizes a task. Yeah. So I have a, a little bit of a random question that, you know, wasn't on our topic guide, but um, I just wanted to ask what your opinion is on this about heavy squatting. And I'll explain kind of why I'm asking the question. In, in life... Um, there, are, it's very rare that you have like outside of obviously carrying some sacks on your back. If you're on a farm, very rarely do you have a heavy, heavy load pushing down on the top of the shoulders in a back squat. And then you going down to the ground and coming up with the exact same load again, versus something like a deadlift. You know, there are times where you have to deadlift, pick something up off the floor, walk with it, and then put it back down again. So where are you, or where do you lie on heavy squatting, specifically back squatting? Yeah, great question. Um, I think if you ask me, you know, if that's something that is common for the body's experience till now, you might, to your point, you might say, no, not really, because, you know, we might load it to the ground, but then, you know, shift it and unload it somewhere as we drop something off. It's a, a sack on our back. If it's a load of any kind, we load it to the shoulder. Uh, and then we put it somewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, the repetitive nature, even if it's a one or two or three RM, right? Uh, then, you know, that, that, that notion may, you could argue that it might not be that common for, you know, our, 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 our lineage, right? Our background, mm -hmm. our experience as human beings. So from that perspective, there needs to be some, uh, I think some anatomical adaptation. There needs to be some bolstering 
yeah. uh, done. If you ask me about back squat relative to if, is it good for a person, uh, it really depends on what they love to do. If someone came to me and said, I just love it. I'm, you know, I'm just well suited for it. My limb structure, my femur length, you know, I feel good under a bar and I love to load it and I want to load more. And that's of high value to me yeah. because what it represents yep. as a coach, but particularly as a health coach, I might say, I value what you value, right? So if it means something to you, then it means something to me. Yeah. And, we'll, and then the goal then is let's do that as safely and uh, for as long as you want to do it. Yeah. Right. Because if you love to do it uh, and then you, you can't anymore because of incapacity. Yeah. That's, that's never an empowering process. Yeah. Right. So with any athletic endeavor, I would say even throwing a javelin as far as you can is probably not normal. Right. For our, yeah. our and, and, you know, playing a sport with high rigor and traveling from different time zones and, you know, cumulative stress is not normal. Yeah. Uh, you know, running endurance sports is not normal yeah. uh, for physiology. And so we see its effects all the time with different genders, like females versus males. I mean, you look at athletics and females and, and amenorrhea is one of them. Like that is not a normal thing. Yeah. And so athletics is to a, to a large degree, not normal. However, we love to do it. And so the idea of squatting has its place, right? Yeah. We, we squat, we can put a lot of load on the trunk. We can put a lot of load on the legs that will reinforce a, a tissue remodeling in the architecture. That'll certainly build a bigger horsepower in our engine. Uh, that'll develop cross-sectional area of the musculature. That'll introduce depolarization, repolar, inter, you know, like intermuscular coordination patterns, intramuscular coordination patterns. All that has a place, right? Yeah. And, and that can definitely create an outcome of athleticism uh, or an outcome of here's how much I can squat. Yeah. Uh, I would say f it, it is unusual for our lineage and a lot of people need some time to get to the foundational elements of a squat. Yeah. Right. So there might be some prophylactic or some kind of anatomical adaptation or some runway that you give them to get to the point of heavy squatting. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be some of the comments that I have around it. Um, yeah. 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 That wasn't meant to get you in trouble. So um, it's just, <laughs> cause I know there, there, it is a polarizing thing, right? Sometimes you have people who just don't back squat. So you have people who talk about that and then you have people who are like, you have to, you have to back squat, like back squat is the exercise, right? A lot of people are, yeah. and those, you know, oftentimes it's those, um, those gym goers who do it often are like, you have to do it. I get something you have to do, yeah, but depend I, on who you are and what you want. Right. Yeah. And I love what you said about, um, you know, uh, I value. So as a coach, I value what you value. And then understanding that there is a trade-off between the joy that you get from a particular, uh, experience, whether it be sport or lifting. And then we have to weigh that with the, the damage that that might do to the body. If we do it repetitively, right? right. Like, I'm, I love to, I'm, I'm a hockey player, soccer player, play lacrosse, play badminton, play squash, play just about every sport. If it has a ball or a puck, I can, and even if it doesn't look like a ball, like a football, I, I can probably play it and I can probably play it reasonably well. I was never a great athlete at, at any one thing, but I was pretty good at everything. I was a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, you were the bane, you were the bane of my existence, Adam. Where I, was like, <laughs> I wanted to be like you. I was just not athletic, right? Yeah, I was, I was the chubby shy kid that wished that they could have some, you know, abilities in sports. So, um, but I hear what you're saying. And, you know, I, I think that there is a trade off and there is something to be said about, um, you know, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of fringe element, like if you want to flirt with the fringe for long enough, yeah. there may be consequences uh, to longevity, there may be consequences to the life, I'm not talking about your life, but the life in, in your participation in that yeah, particular endeavor. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Um, I wonder though, um, and I don't know if you have a, a comment on this, but I wonder because like squatting in a lot of cultures is a, it's a resting posture, right? For us, not so much in, in North America, uh, a little bit more with certain pockets, but it's really not a resting posture for us anymore, but it's what a lot of people do in a lot of parts of the world. It's a resting position. And if, you know, Philip Beach, you know, he's got his, uh, his stuff that he talks about that in, in depth. 
And so I wonder what adding a whole bunch of stress to something that your body sees previously as a resting posture, what that then does to its ability to then perceive that as a resting posture, right? It's the same thing with sitting. When you sit for too often, too long, your body doesn't actually see that as a resting because you're super stressed in that position. So I'm, I wonder, I don't know. Yeah, it's good. And, and you know, you're right. It, if we, we, we squatted to defecate, um, you know, the spine's in a very decompressed position in a full squat. The femurs are pushing on your ascending and descending colon to help you defecate, uh, you know, all of those types of things. Um, and I would argue that we do have some degree of load in deep squat too, as we, you know, pick up kids and do what we yep. did. But yeah, I think that that idea of load uh, itself uh, and depending on what range of motion you go through uh, does create a different neural tag after a while, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be interesting. I'm not sure if anybody's ever done uh, comments on that. I'm not sure how you would actually research something like that. Um, I don't know if you really can, but that would be interesting to uh, check out. Um, so last kind of thing before we, we take a little bit of a break is the development of tolerance in a lot of these positions. So there's an argument for a lot of, you know, um, squatting or doing different things like uh, Jefferson curls, those types of things, you are trying to develop resiliency. So you're trying to keep the stress, you know, just below where that threshold is and then get adequate recovery. And then just below the threshold and trying to push that threshold up for things like, uh, you know, so Jefferson curl specifically for spine mobility and the strength and tolerance of the spine in different positions, even though it's literally just sagittal and then back up and sagittal and back up. Um, so wh where's, where's the line with that when it comes to the dose response of the body and how does a trainer determine that in a client? Yeah, that's pretty tough. Um, but it, you're right. I mean, if we're looking at the idea of stress and recovery and we're we're understanding what you're saying which is i always want to flirt with that edge mm -hmm. uh, to allow for super compensation and to me that is engineering stress right so you're engineering a stressful bout so you can try to overreach mm -hmm. right and then chronic overreaching uh if it's not done with enough adequate rest is overtraining which is a cascade of different things that don't help us but with engineered recovery, chronic over or, or, or bouts of overreaching, I should say, yeah. with inter, interlaced with uh, proper recovery is a good program. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, talking to a lot of individuals that are in the recovery space, they would say that it's pretty hard to overtrain, but it's pretty darn easy to under recover. Yeah. And so the idea here is how do we recover and, and what does that actually look like? And so... Uh, that we, we look, we talk about that. It's a, a program is not how we just stress the body every time a program is really, how do we look at the undulation between stress and recovery so that we can, we can flirt with the edge and then we can allow for recovery to create some homeostasis out of the allostasis that we are in introducing to the body, which is that cumulative stress. Right. And so if we can, if we can engineer recovery then what we do is we build a couple of things. We build larger capacity and tolerance, this larger resiliency. And then, you know, the idea of that going to the edge and then mm. having that be the mechanism for the response of the body to get better. Uh, that's where it's harnessed, right? Is during the recovery. Yeah. How yeah. we recover is a critical question. And what's kind of cool is if we look at the recovery uh, landscape right now, there are those that are looking at recovery with just as much focus with, with, with just as much consideration as the fitness and the SNC community are talking about stress. Mm -hmm. All of these concepts and all of the nuance of stress is what's been batted around forever in fitness and performance, which is great. And now we're starting to see emerged a similar type of concept and uh, similar type of thinking as it relates to recovery. Like you're not going to recover every time the same way. And yeah. you may not recover after particular bouts, or you may not recover the same way if you're after a different goal. Yeah. Right. You know, if your goal in the intermediacy of things is, um, you know, let's say mass gain, right? So cross sectional area gain, you're going to actually hold inflammation into your system longer than you would if you're a weight loss client. Yeah. 
uh, simply because you know inflammation to a certain point is a a precursor is a catalyst toward protein synthesis. Yeah. So in ways in which you modulate that are going to determine the reaction, the signaling of how you, in this case, you know, incite protein synthesis. Yeah. And so there's ways in which we can do that. And then a certain phases of your training, you're actually going to want to get rid of inflammation because of certain other factors, cumulative stress and, and you know, gland secretion, et cetera. Yeah. So there are some interesting things there. Yeah. So just for, uh, for listeners, if they wanted to, and for myself, cause I want to bring somebody on, you know, one of those uh, recovery specialists to really dive into that. Um, are there a couple people you would recommend a couple of resources you would recommend for that? Yeah. So we, we actually did this, we have these things called four Q and they're, they're say they stand for four quadrants. So we have these schemes that, you know, make a person consider variability. Yeah. And our, we've got a 4Q neuromechanical, which is basically how you load the body and how you move the body. Mm -hmm. We've got a 4Q metabolic, which means metabolic flexibility, which is how you stress the substrates and energy systems. Uh, and then the last one is 4Q recovery. And our co-author is Brandon Marcello. So he okay. is, so Brandon Marcello, uh, I think, I think he got his PhD from Baylor and was with Stanford for a, for a number of years as uh, one of their heads of, of, um, of performance and has since moved on and you know, works a lot with first responder groups and other organizations as a performance strategist. And what that means is he's taking a look at these types of things, like yeah. how do you stress, but how do you recover? Yeah. And he was our co-author for our 4Q uh, recovery uh, model. Awesome. Yeah, so he, he would be one. Okay. So um, I actually think that's a great spot because I want to save all the 4Q stuff for part number two. So we will uh, stop it there and we will see you in part number two. State of the Industry Podcast. I'll be back.